Well, welcome back to another episode of the Canadian Immigration Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, coming to you myself from the beautiful province of Alberta, Canada. My guest today is Robert Leong from Vancouver and the firm of Lowen Company. And Robert has been a past guest on two previous occasions with me, and I couldn't help but get him back. How are you doing, Robert? I'm doing good, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. It's been a while. It has. I was quite surprised that, uh, you know, that it had been so long since we last did our, our last episode of the podcast. And now this is almost morphed, Robert, into something I guess you'd call a, a vodcast because, uh, you know, video is, is really taking a surge here. And with the YouTube channel, I'm yeah. almost at the stage where I'm, I'm thinking about calling, calling this the, uh, th this channel. I've got Immigration Nation and I'm thinking about calling it Canadian Immigration Nation and then merging the two together. But at this stage... Listeners will still be able to hear this on the Canadian Immigration Podcast, but they'll all be able, also be able to watch this as they are um, on the YouTube channel. So great to have you here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Happy to be here. I mean, I, I think your YouTube channel is ex excellent. I mean, I watch it, I subscribe to it, and I would encourage people to do the same as well. Well, uh, coming from you, Robert, uh, that, that means a lot, my friend. You know, I always wonder what my <laughs> peers think of what I'm doing. And I know some of them think I'm a little crazy, but especially during this TR to PR pathway world that we're experiencing right now. And as we record this on April the 30th, 2021, um, it's quite amazing. And it'll be interesting to see how things play out after this pandemic with these big, massive um, influxes of, of people that may not have necessarily high human capital like we're used to seeing. Yeah. So, how they, you know, how I mean, they for, adjust. Yeah, for sure, definitely. I, I think you've got a, a lot of great content uh, uh, on your show. And, uh, you know, I especially enjoy those where you're actually outdoors, yeah. you know, when you're oh, on the water, <laughs> when you're yeah. in the bush. I actually yeah. enjoy those a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. I recorded those last summer and I've got a whole bunch of new ones that I'm going to be recording this year. I actually have got myself a little drone, a little mini a little mini lightweight little drone with a camera and to get some other, wow. you know, imaging and stuff like that. So, but then people will be able to see how, how fat I am, Robert, how much weight I've put on since COVID. <laughs> so I, I better get out and get some exercising. So they'll be like, my goodness, Mark, <laughs> you've put on a lot of weight. Yes, I have. That's all right. Life is good. <laughs> so as I yeah, was saying, yeah, Robert, yeah. the last time, uh, hmm. the last time you joined, we was way back. I was looking at the date, October the 14th. 2017 and not much has changed really we talked about um, permanent resident card extensions and basically strategies for retaining PR if you're outside of Canada and um, you know if you're kind of stuck in that that period where you're wondering if it's going to work out and so I would encourage listeners to go back and watch that one and then the very very first one that Robert did was way back in 2016 um, was basically what to do when your LMIA is refused and and Robert pushed back one of his companies they he didn't agree with what, you know, what immigration or ESDC at the time had decided. And, um, and so he pushed back and it was a really important case for all of us. And so mm -hmm. that's what immigration lawyers do, right, Robert? We don't just accept decisions if we feel they're wrong. Um, we use the, the tools in our toolbox to make sure that they're accountable and, and make things better for everyone that's applying through the programs. Yeah, I mean, that's a part of the practice that I quite enjoy i mean which is you know to to really you know make sure that the, the 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 people who are looking at applications are doing it properly and that's all we're asking right we're just asking them to do it properly and making sure that uh, you know the applicants get a fair shake uh, and i enjoy that part tremendously well, today mm -hmm. uh, we've got an interesting topic and it's one that will be very very important for newcomers to canada as opposed to, you know, uh, everybody really eventually will need to hear what Robert has to say today. But Robert, before we get into that, can you talk a little bit about how you yourself found yourself practicing, practicing as an immigration lawyer right now? So how did that come about? Yeah, actually, that that's, uh, you know, that kind of segues into uh, what we hope to discuss today, because I've seen so many experts on your channel, you know, <laughs> so many esteemed colleagues with uh, uh, who are experts in the law and, 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 and all that. And I thought, hey, you know, what could I add to your your channel? And, and I think maybe um, 
I may be one of the few lawyers who have walked both sides of the aisle. And, and, and that means that I've been an immigrant myself. I mean, I immigrated to Canada, so I've gone through that process myself. I've gone through that process of requalifying as a lawyer. And now I practice as an immigration lawyer, helping others to immigrate. So back to your, your question, I mean, I uh, trained as a lawyer in England. So I, I, I read law in England, uh, qualified there, and then returned to my native Singapore, where I had to qualify as a lawyer in Singapore, uh, practiced in Singapore uh, for about 15 years, and then immigrated to Canada with my family. So when I came to Canada, um, I had to, again, go through the requalification process to become a lawyer. And, uh, you know, I kind of stumbled into immigration uh, by chance, as is a lot of your guests mm -hmm. that I, I, I found. Um, so, so what happened was that... Um, during the requalification pro process, uh, some people actually said to me, hey, uh, you have a legal background, so uh, why not try and become an immigration consultant? Yes. And so I said, hey, that sounds like a good idea. And uh, I went and got trained with uh, Ashton College. So I did an immigration consultant's diploma there. So actually, I, I'm, I, I quite I'm quite friendly with quite a number of immigration consultants and I know the process that they go through and with that training uh, I applied I, I had to article uh, with law firms that's part of the training process and uh, it wasn't easy as a mature person uh, sending out applications for articles uh, but I was very thankful that uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, from Low & Company um, uh, looked at my resume and uh, uh, was happy to offer me a place in articles. And I've been with the firm ever since. So that's kind of how I ended up in immigration. Interesting. And, you know, lots of people, when they come to Canada and they're completing their EAPR, they're immigrating through express entry, one of the attestations or acknowledgements that they make is that they understand that if they're working in a regulated occupation, that they may not be able to work in that, you know, if that's their experience when they come to Canada and they, they make them acknowledge that thing, which is, um, you know, it can be <clears throat> kind of discouraging when you've spent so many years in your home country and you're really an expert in your field. And then you mm -hmm. come to Canada and they say, well, no, you can't practice in that because you don't have the Canadian equivalent. So, what was it like it what was it like for you going through that process and I'm assuming because it was a common law jurisdiction that it wasn't quite the hurdles that some of our our civil law um, you know colleagues have had to go through um, but what was that process like because you guarantee would have had to take you know the charter and, and you know constitutional law and and administrative law probably and those kinds of things um, mm -hmm. so what was that like for you yeah I mean you know the, it, it was tough. Um, very humbling. Uh, you know, you, you're right. I, I was very fortunate because having trained in England and having practiced in Singapore, which is also a common law jurisdiction, so I was given quite a lot of waivers in terms of what I had to go through to requalify. I still had to take exams. Um, and after I cleared those exams, I was put on equal footing with a fresh graduate from law school in Canada, even though I have, I had by that time, uh, you know, at least 15 years of practice under my belt. Yeah. And let's, uh, let's so qualify. it was very challenging. Yeah. yeah. Let's qualify that, that Robert, because when you say that you were on equal footing, the reality is they didn't recognize that you'd been a practicing lawyer for 15 years, but equal footing means they, they demoted you essentially to treat you as if you had no experience and you were green as green coming out of law school. So that's, that's actually not a good thing, just to clarify for our, for our viewers and listeners. Yeah, it, it was humbling, like, like, like I said, um, you know, but, uh, it, and, and I've seen a lot of people go through, you know, greater hurdles than I had. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, I know some lawyers who qualified in China. They basically had to go back to law school and get a law degree in Canada. Yeah. 
Yeah. Very common. Even even Igor, Robert, in my office, who's kind of my right arm mm-hmm. man who helps me to set everything up. He's got a master's in law from the Ukraine. And, and he's, because it's a civil jurisdiction, when he comes, um, now that he's here and he started to explore it, he's been here a year now, um, he's now come to the realization that he will need to either do a master's, an LLM, or mm-hmm. redo first year at least, and um, and then go through the articling process. And even to do that, and get all of that through to get his call in Alberta. It's probably going to be four, almost five years away from now. Fortunately, yeah. he's a young guy, so it's not, he's got time to, to spend, but, but we are actually looking at the Queens program. So we're looking at having him go yeah. and take that uh, so that he can at least start working within our firm under, you know, our, our supervision of the lawyers that are here and, and train up and, you know, and, uh, and then get his, his articles and, and call. And so that's right. Um, yeah. So and, and I think we, we, we see this not just for lawyers, we see it for foreign trained nurses, uh, foreign trained doctors. Uh, a lot of the regulated uh, professions have that problem. And it's a little bit. It's a bit of a disconnect because, you know, on the one hand, the federal government is sort of, you know, welcoming highly trained, skilled uh, foreign nationals to immigrate to Canada and then. Uh, we've heard stories about many of these people, you know, they come here and they find that they cannot practice in their profession and they become underemployed, uh, primarily because of hurdles from the provincial uh, professional organizations, not so much the federal government. So I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, and, and that's been a problem even up to now, actually. I know in Alberta, they enacted some, some legislation to cut through that red tape. And, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk with um, Minister Copping and, and his um, Minister of Employment and Immigration here in Alberta. I haven't had a chance to connect with him for a little while. But that was one of the pillars before the pandemic hit. It was a real concerted yeah. effort to cut through that. And you've identified, yeah. um, you know, something that, that many people don't understand is that this isn't immigration that's doing this or the federal government. It is the provincial mm-hmm. regulatory bodies. And I'll give you an example, Robert, of a, a client who came in with her husband and her husband was, um, he worked in low skill positions for a number of years. And so she couldn't get a work permit. And she was a trained nurse in Germany. And mm. there was one program, and you probably don't remember it, a number of years back in Alberta that they called uh, Alberta Express kind of, and it was open for about four months and they just managed to hit it just perfect. And then, you know, they were probably here for about three or four years. And by the time they got their permanent resident status, her, um, her work experience was too old. So she couldn't go and, and challenge, you know, the, the nursing credential certification because her work experience was wow. older than what they recognized. And, and it was a disappointment because she would have been an unbelievable uh, nurse in the system here. Now she's mm-hmm. gone on and done things, but I personally I thought I saw that as a real tragedy. Yeah. So I mean it's it's not all doom and gloom, obviously. I mean, I, I, yeah. I do want to offer some encouragement to to the people watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the one word that I always use is you have to be resilient. Uh, as an immigrant, as a new immigrant, you have to be resilient. You you have to keep at it. You have to do it for your family, as most immigrants are doing, um, you know. And uh, but, you know, to 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 sort of advise people that you have to come in with your eyes open, right? The the application is just the first step. Then you got to think about, okay, what am I going to do once I'm here? What kind of job am I going to take? Uh, what processes do I have to go through? And you really have to walk through all of that. Uh, it's it's all the due diligence that you have to do uh, and not just the application for permanent residence itself. So, you know, I encourage people, you know, to not to lose heart, you know, keep at it, um, you know, and you, you'll actually find that a lot of the new immigrants are very, very resilient. They're very optimistic. Yeah. That's a great, that's great insight because, you know, obviously... When I'm, I'll be honest, Robert, when I'm looking for new employees for my firm, Mm -hmm. I'm kind of partial to new immigrants and, um, you know, they're wonderful people. 
right now the standards to immigrate through the economic programs are so high that they're often way more educated and their their English is almost as as good or better than you know some of the native born Canadians and and there's just this when you talk about resilience there's this desire to really excel and and take this opportunity that they have to to achieve all of the dreams that they've had in their lives and and so there's you talk about initiative too you know that mm-hmm. is just inbred into into newcomers to Canada and so i i have a, a kind of a soft spot in my firm for 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 newcomers they're just wonderful additions yeah. to my firm so yeah and and you know hopefully even for uh you know canadian employers who may be watching this you know for a very long time we've we've heard about how canadian employers would only hire people with canadian experience, experience. i mean i don't really know what that means yeah. and uh there are i think more and more employers now uh, realizing as you do uh, how hardworking and, and how resilient and uh, uh, new, new immigrants can be, and uh, you know, don't shut out people just because you're unfamiliar with their track record from overseas, yeah. because uh, you know they could really be people that are very experienced in their field, and you just need that opportunity. And everybody, yeah. whether you have Canadian experience or not, each company has their own process of doing things. And you think mm-hmm. even within our firms, right? We, you know, we have our feelings about, you know, our colleagues and, you know, we, some we really respect and some, well, not as much. And sometimes if we have people that are coming and applying to our firm and they've worked somewhere else and, you know, and, and then we, we might have this feeling even amongst them that, well, that was one way you did it in that other place, but this is how we do it here in our firm. So you need to, you need mm-hmm. to learn and get experience doing it our way. Right. And so that, mm-hmm. that mentality is even, even internally within, uh, within Canada. So I think, yeah, just to recognize for, for newcomers that, yeah, it can be tough. Yeah. It can be tough for everybody sometimes. Sure. And, and you, you're right. And, 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 you know, I, I'm not, uh, you know, totally, uh, against regulatory bodies for requiring high standards for for new immigrants to come in to want to practice in professions. I mean, I went through it. I understand that there are reasons for uh, making me take the exams. There were reasons for making me go through articles and all that. And I can understand all that, uh, and I can certainly identify with, you know, making sure that you know people from across the world, you come here. You make sure you know how the way things are done here before we we, we let you practice. And yeah. um, so I can understand that totally. Yeah. So Robert, you yeah. went through the process of um, finding a job. You know, you mm-hmm. had to start from scratch, and and you had to after you were graduated and put. You know, even even before you went through articles, you 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 know went and completed your consultant certification, and then we're doing your practicum training. You, you had to get that first practicum or you had to, that, that you had to go through that process. So can you shed some yeah. light or maybe some tips to the viewers on, you know, getting that job and, 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 you know, navigating this, the hiring process in Canada? Sure. Um, again, I would always just encourage people to, to just not lose heart, just keep trying. Uh, you have to really grow very thick skin and, uh, what have you got to lose, right? So, you know, just go out, put yourself out there, keep trying. If people turn you down, you know, just uh, water off the duck's back, right? Just keep trying, don't lose heart. Uh, I, you know, along the way, somebody may recognize what you have and 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 give you that opportunity. So, I mean, I, I sent out many, many letters for articles to different firms. I uh, had a whole lot of uh, re- uh, rejections. Uh, some didn't even bother to reply to me, uh, but you know you just need that one opportunity to 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 demonstrate what you can do, and 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 so uh, you know just keep at it. That that's that's what I would say. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna dig in a little bit deeper because we need to <clears throat> we need to get in a little bit more inside here. So <laughs> so how did you break that barrier with Jeffrey? So how did you manage to to get yeah. him to bite? 
Well, Jeffrey may not remember this, but uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, I sent in a resume to him, uh, and then I still remember one night I was at a, a restaurant with my family, and I got a call on my cell phone, uh, cell phone, and it was from Jeffrey, and and he said, "Hey, I, I got your resume, and it looks interesting. It looks like you had some training in immigration." Uh, looks like I'm from Singapore as well, so there's a little bit of connection there. Yes. And uh, he asked me to come down to have coffee with him, mm-hmm. not an offer of a job, just to have coffee with him. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, that's fine. I, I got nothing to lose. You know, I've got uh, mm-hmm. plenty of time. So yep. we arranged for a time for me to pop in to see him, and uh, it was only supposed to be like a thirty-minute you know, conversation, you know, yeah. just to find out what, what I'm doing, you know, what, yeah. and just from talking to him and sharing with him about my journey, it turned into a two hour conversation. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really had an idea of what the firm was about, what he was doing. And I think he was also trying to, you know, figure out who I am and who I was and, and uh, what I did. Uh, now, at the end of the meeting, he stood up, shook my <laughs> hand, and said, thank you very much for coming in. All the best to you. All the best. <laughs> so he didn't offer me a job. <laughs> he just said, thank you for coming in. All the best to you. And yeah. I just walked out. And, and I said, <laughs> okay, you know, again, what have I got to lose, right? So yeah. I met somebody. I made a contact. Yes, and that was fine. So I walked away, and I think it was about a week later that I got another phone call from him, and he said, "You, you know what? Um, what happened was that he had originally already uh, promised articles to a different person, and he wasn't sure that he could take on two article mm. students. So, so he ended up having to go and check with the law society." And Law Society said, yeah, that's fine. You can take on two. So that's when he called me back and said, hey, you know, I found out that I can take on two article students. So I'd like to offer uh, that position to you as well. Would you be prepared to come in? And I said, yeah, definitely. So 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 that's kind of how I ended up uh, with with Jeffrey. And I've been with him ever since. Yeah, that's a wonderful story. And, you know, there's Mm -hmm. I think even as I went around looking for positions myself, you know, inter- interviewing with a lot of firms. I <clears throat> was trying to get a job with one of the bigger firms in Calgary. I remember I had a couple mm-hmm. young young ones and another one on the way and <clears throat> I needed to make hay while the sun shined. So <clears throat> I, um, yeah, I remember knocking and having interview after interview. And uh, in the end of the day, one offered me a position and it was a perfect fit for me. But uh, there's a lot of rejections down that path. And uh you know, there, I, I, you know, there's one of the things that we've been talking a lot about within the Canadian Bar Association is just is is racism and the complexities that exist within that, and you know, trying to break those barriers down. And you know, I'm sitting here as a, I guess I'm described as a white male of privilege, privilege, right? And uh, and that's fair. I'm a farm kid. I didn't have anything when I started, but at the end of the day, you know, I don't face, I didn't face those barriers just with. Um, um, you know, with people looking at me and, you know, making, making any kind of, um, uh, I guess, judgments on me and my abilities based on where I come from. And so um, I didn't have those barriers, but a lot of people mm-hmm. do and a lot of immigrants do and they're realities. And even amongst our profession, you know, it's even with an international credential, you're not treated in many respects the same way as someone who has gone through. And, um, and even if you have gone the certification, it's like, well, you didn't go to law school in Canada. So somehow that's, you know, not quite as, um, as good if, as if someone... So when you said you're on the same level playing field as, as new grads, you probably weren't, Robert. You were probably even a step below them because your education was not from one of the local, you know, one of the law schools in Canada. So I don't know if you have, and I didn't mean to kind of put you on the spot, but I don't know if you have any thoughts mm-hmm. on because these are realities. And, you know, I think it's important for all of us to recognize that this yeah. exists. Well, 
you know, there, there were certainly uh, some instances that come to mind, uh, not not bad experiences. I mean, uh, so, you know, when I had to go through the requalification, uh, we had to go through the PLTC, the Law Society course, uh, to, to requalify. And so I was put in this sort of classroom with a whole bunch of uh, uh, different people. Uh, most of them were new graduates from law school in Canada. And a few of us were sort of the older lawyers who were trained overseas. And, you know, the, 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 the young graduates were as, as typical of young <laughs> law they graduates. Were they very, were confident, were they? They were confident? They, they were very confident. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm, I'm a new graduate. You know, the world is at my feet now. And, mm -hmm. and they had all that information, which was fresh in their mind because they just came out of law school. Uh, so I think what stuck in my mind was that we had a, uh, one exercise, which was to do a mock argument uh, in, in front of a judge. And a lot of the young graduates, uh, you know, they, they gave it their best shot. And, you know, some of them had, you know, obviously they did mock trials and, and things like that. And, you know, they did fairly well. But mm -hmm. I think what stood out between them and the experienced lawyers was that experience. And, and it, it came out very clearly that those who had gone to court, who made arguments, uh, definitely knew what they were doing. Mm. And you could see that marked difference uh, with the new graduates. And I think sort of perceptions change slightly after that, you know, that, uh, hey, you know, we're not just a bunch of old guys who, yeah. who, who don't know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. So that was one incident, you know, but uh, the other thing also is, um, you know, you talked about our profession. Um, it was an interesting thing for me to note in the early days. So I've been uh, in Vancouver for more than 10 years now. And so Jeffrey used to bring me along to the our immigration section meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we used to have those, those in person. I uh, remember. Those seems like yes. an eternity ago. Yeah. And what was interesting to me was that as I attended those early meetings and I scanned the room, Jeffrey and I were probably the only two visible minorities in the room, which was very surprising to me given that we were in the immigration field. Uh and I was very surprised by that. Um, but, uh, you know, I certainly felt that, at least in BC, I don't know about other provinces, there was a lot of camaraderie amongst the immigration lawyers. I certainly didn't feel that I was treated any differently by the other immigration lawyers. Uh, they were very welcoming, very helpful. Uh, and I can see that the the bar has changed in the last 10 years. I think we're seeing more and more visible minorities now. Every time we go for the full reception at the start of the, the year, uh, I see new faces and, you know, it's changed. Um, and I've met a lot of immigration lawyers who really have a heart uh, for immigrants, for people who are different from themselves and uh, they, some of them are even more passionate than I am, you know, so I'm actually very encouraged by that. And uh, I mean, I cannot speak about what happens uh, outside of the immigration bar, uh, uh, but at least in the immigration bar, I think people have uh, their heart in the right place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So, Robert, you mm -hmm. at some point, if we flash back, you made a decision at some point that you'd like to immigrate to Canada. And mm -hmm. there was a process where you had to do your due diligence and figure out if this really was the best place for you. So if you were to give advice to newcomers on their decision-making, because obviously Canada is very popular these days, what kind of things mm -hmm. would you tell them or what would you have them do in terms of this due diligence process to understand what they might be expecting and, and how to prepare or even to decide maybe Canada isn't the place for them. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, a great question. I mean, having dealt with so many different immigrants from different countries, I think there's always this pervading theme 
uh, for uh, immigrants who have children. They're usually doing it uh, to make sure that this, the next generation has better opportunities, has a better life. Uh, for younger immigrants, they're also looking for that for themselves. So, you know, you really need to find out, you know, what you're in for. Uh, you know, if possible, uh, find out what it's what it's like to to work here, to study here, to live here. Uh, I know not everybody will have that opportunity. So in, in a sense, the way that the current program works where, you know, people need to come here and study and work before being able to immigrate, I think that's a good a step in the right direction because it allows people to assess whether this is really right for them. Because immigration is not for everybody. If you don't have the stomach for it, you know, if you just have this fairyland idea of what immigration is, you do it because other people are doing it. If you don't really, you know, think about the nuts and bolts of it, then you just increase the chances that you will be disillusioned, you will fail. Uh, I know of immigrants who've come in and who've gone back to their home countries because they just didn't feel this was right to them. And that's totally fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, Canada has a lot of things going for it, but it's not for everybody. Uh, and and I so so I think that people need to uh, be very realistic uh, about how things would be, uh, and and come and experience it. Uh, if it's not right for them, I don't think there's any shame uh, in, in in admitting that. You know, uh, there are people who sort of given up their permanent residence, renounced it, mm -hmm. gone back to their home countries. That's, that's totally fine. Uh, you know, very often they carry some cultural baggage with them. You know, they, they immigrate and people from their home countries are saying, okay, you know, you know, and then when they see them coming back, they feel as if they're failures because they haven't succeeded in what they did. And I don't think it should be looked at that way. It's just, you know, it's not suitable. Uh, you know, I, didn't like it, came back. I think that's totally fine. And and so I really encourage people to, you know, come and find out what it's like. Uh, you know, there's so many cases I've heard of, you know, people who do consultations with me and they say, I want to immigrate to Canada. And I, have you ever been to Canada? What do you know about Canada? And they know next to nothing. And, you know, that's always very dangerous uh, uh, if they go down that path. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the last question here, you've been in Canada for how long now? How long have you been here? Well, uh, we landed in 2007. So okay. just more than 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. So you've had 10 years now to kind of become fully integrated and, and uh, you are far, far from a newcomer. But as you look back, what would you say mm -hmm. is is one of the most positive benefits that has come to you and your family from making that decision to immigrate? Um, Canadians, by and large, are very accepting, uh, very nice people. Um, uh, sometimes uh, even too nice. <laughs> I, found, I mean, coming from a from, from an environment where, you know, sometimes we're very on guard about, uh, you know, uh, people around us. Uh, Canadians are very accepting, very nice on the whole. Um, and I've never really felt uh, um, disadvantaged in, in uh, my practice as an immigration lawyer. Obviously, in the past year, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, anti-Asian uh, incidents going up, I mean, that's been a cause of concern for me, uh, not so much for myself, but more, more for my family. So I've got a wife and two daughters, and my wife does the groceries uh, every week. So she's out there while I'm in my office, and that worries me. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's probably just a small minority uh, of people. Um, but, uh, it, you know, on the whole, in the last 10 years, we really appreciated the, the vastness of this country, uh, how beautiful it is. 
um, you know, that I, I could drive a whole day and still be uh, within British Columbia, not even into the next province. Uh, if I have to fly to Eastern Canada, it takes me five hours to get there. Yeah. The vastness of it, um, uh, the nice people that we've met. Uh, in terms of the immigration process, the immigration system is not perfect, but then again, uh, nowhere is perfect. Uh, you know, I've I've been uh, handling immigration appeals, uh, judicial reviews, and by and large, you know, uh, we do what we can. I think people want to do the right thing. You do have one or two instances where it's sort of out of the ordinary, but by and large, people want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a sign of a, a mature democracy, uh, a mature uh, uh, civil service. Uh, and that's really very um, encouraging. And just to share with you, uh, last week, uh, I appeared at the Federal Court of Appeal for the very first time. Oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's a milestone for me. I never thought that uh, a guy from Singapore uh, who never practiced immigration law before would ever have the opportunity to appear in front of the Federal Court of Appeal. Uh, and I was given that opportunity. So, wonderful. you know, that meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Robert. This has been excellent. I, as you can see, I love doing this. I love doing podcasts. I love doing uh, videos, live streaming with our Immigration Nation, um, largely for this reason. I get to see the amazing things that the immigration lawyers within our Canadian Bar Association and, and within our bar generally, the things that they do. And I think mm -hmm. the common thread throughout all of it is a real sincere caring for the work that we do and the people we represent. And that shows mm -hmm. through. And you are such a, such a humble, humble man and someone that I've respected for a long time. And it's a pleasure to have you back with me. There's a reason that you're back here for number three is is because when you when you come it's it's something that people are going to want to listen to and we're going to share this i'm going to share this with our bar i'm going to i'm going to post it on the listserv and let people know that uh, they need to listen to this and watch this because it's um it's it's really really insightful and i appreciate it robert so grateful that, for having me <laughs> on yeah yeah you're very welcome and now that all these people that are watching this on the uh, the youtube channel and everywhere else facebook um they're looking for a an amazingly skilled and, and just kind uh, lawyer to, to take on their difficult case. How do they find you? What is the best way for them to, to reach out to you, Robert, and, and connect and, and book a paid consultation and, and get things moving? Sure. So, so uh, we have a website, Law & Company, uh, canadavisalaw.com. Uh, that's the best way to, to get hold of me and just uh, contact the uh, information email there and uh, if they want to book a consultation, uh, happy to assist anybody who needs help. Excellent. Thanks so much, Robert. We'll make sure that we Thank put you. the show notes here for the video and then <clears throat> those that can, can find you now know where to get you on the web. Thanks so much. Thank okay. you so much. You bet. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.